and to Friday Nights at NOMA. Uh, my name is Allison Young. I'm a curatorial fellow for contemporary art here at NOMA, and I'm so excited to welcome you to tonight's lecture where we're gonna hear from the artist Leslie Dill, whose um, immersive mixed media installation called Hell, 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 Heaven, 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 Encountering Sister Gertrude Morgan and Revelation is one of the projects featured in our current exhibition, Changing Course, Reflecting on New Orleans Histories. Um, and it's also a work that Noma is very proud to have in our permanent collection, and we're very pleased to have Leslie with us tonight. Um, before I introduce her, I just wanted to um, give a quick preview of some of the programming that we still have in store for Changing Course, which runs through September 16th. So you'll have a chance to hear directly from a few more of the artists who are part of the exhibition as part of our Artists' Perspective series, which takes place um, certain Friday nights at 6 p.m. Um, so this continues on August 17th with a talk by the artist Katrina Andre. Um, after that, Willie Birch will be joining us on August 31st. And finally, we'll have a chance to hear from Skylar Fine on September 14th. And again, all of these talks are at 6 p.m. Um, on September 7th, we have a community night here at NOMA that's kind of a celebration of changing course. Um, on that evening, we're offering free admission. We'll have gallery tours, live music, food trucks, as well as a roundtable discussion here in the auditorium about the Everyday New Orleans project, um, which is a kind of a community-centered photography project. Um, so definitely come out for that. And finally, we have a film series called Picturing Us, which features documentaries that look at different moments in the history of New Orleans. Um, so check our website for more information about all of that. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce Leslie. Um, so Leslie Dill is an American artist whose practice is rooted in the intersection of language and fine art. She was born in Bronxville, New York, and grew up in Maine and the Adirondacks, but now lives in Brooklyn, New York. Her work uh, deals with a variety of materials, um, including horsehair, muslin, photography, thread, metal, and fabric, many of which you'll see in the installation um, that's on view in Changing Course. And these elegant sculptures, installations, photographs, and performances draw from her travels abroad and her interests in spirituality, um, literature, faith, and gender. Leslie has had over 100 solo exhibitions since the early 1980s, and her work is collected by several museums in the United States including the Albright Knox Gallery, the Cleveland Museum of Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Modern Art, and the Whitney Museum in New York, as well as NOMA. Um, and she's been the recipient of numerous grants and fellowships, including the 2017 John Simon Guggenheim F Foundation Fellowship. Her opera, Divine Light, which is based on the poems of Emily Dickinson, was performed in San Jose in 2008. And more recently this year, a new version premiered at the New Camerata Opera Company in New York City. Dill lives and works in Brooklyn, New York, but she has also been a fixture on the art scene here in New Orleans for quite some time and has shown with Arthur Roger Gallery for several decades. Um, and on that note, we're pleased to welcome her back and I'll be glad to invite her to the stage. Thank you very much for coming. So, so I fell for her, and um, this, this exhibition was curated. It was called The Tools of Her Ministry, and it was curated by someone you know, Bill Fagley. Thank you, Bill. This book was really it's a, a Bible for me in, in making this exhibit, so I thank you for being you. There you are. There she is. So, so I fell right into her fervent spiritual world 
swirl of text and images, people and angels and beasts of revelation. How did this happen? You know, in a way, falling in love is, is something of an accident. It's a blind date. You go somewhere and you go, wow, it's like you slipped and fell on a banana peel. You know, something impacts you. So how does one's life prepare you to fall in love at a particular time in a particular place? You know, whoever you're with today, tonight, or yesterday, or in the future, you know, sometimes you say, well, why didn't we meet before? And what happened that you would meet now? So my talk tonight is my story of my journey into encountering Sister Gertrude Morgan and Revelation. As Allison said, thank you, Allison. My life's work has been a long, deep dive into the marriage of text and image. For what led me into this artwork in homage to Sister Gertrude, I'll start with music and performance. In 2008, I conceived. <laughs> Bear with me. I conceived and directed um, an opera inspired by the poetry of Emily Dickinson. Here it is. So it's a 10 minute selection. Not to worry, it's not the 120 minute version. It's only a 10 minute selection. Now, Erica. Vanish, 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 vanish
also had a magic book. She had the Bible. Okay, I know that this totally looks like a blind date that is not <laughs> going to work out. I actually, my husband and I lived in India for two years, but I actually sent this picture to my parents and I said, you know, Ed and I broke up and I met this new guy. And, um, but in India, living in India for two years, I found something that I knew already. I found I was attracted to irrational doorways of understanding, other parallel forces in, in addition to words have long run through me beyond text. And these forces opened me up to Sister Gertrude Morgan. There was a reason for my openness. Okay, now this is also a funny picture, but not such a funny picture. Okay, there was a reason for my openness. <laughs> okay, I, so when I was a 14-year-old girl, Growing up in Maine, I had a secret. I had something that I had never spoken of to anyone. And this is what happened. I was getting dressed and getting ready to go to school, and I saw the dark oak leaves against the light of the early, early morning sky. And, and suddenly, I was all I. My, visual screen went black, the world, the, the normal world disappeared, and inside this blackness, here, here's another black slide, and inside this blackness, um, there were threads of white light, and I, I saw war, and violence, and murder, and it was horrible, but I, I also heard the words pestilence and ravaging. Yet, in the midst of this viewable distress, I actually felt bliss. I felt complete rapture. And I had the understanding that I was to know the world. And I, I want to tell you that what I felt then was that it's all right, that everything, I mean, everything's not all right, but everything's all right and meant to be. So, oops, I'll go back to the dark. Um, so, so what do you do? Nothing. If you're a 14 year old girl growing up in Maine with two school teachers for parents, we didn't talk about anything personal. So I had no context for this. So I went downstairs, had Cheerios, and then seven years later, I was in um, college, and there was a class called Ecstasy. And so, who would not take that class? So I took that class. <laughs> Good 1980s person. And, um, and the teacher passed out a questionnaire. And he said, have you ever had a vision, a dream, a moment when time stood still? And in that instant, the entire memory of the vision came back to me. I think it's so weird. I mean, I had a recovered spiritual experience, which is, is, is so odd. And it felt odd then. So I never spoke of it to, to anyone. So then I was, what, 21? And um, I thought people would, I don't know. I didn't know how to contextualize it. So I never spoke of it until I was invited to do an artist in the community project in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And I thought, Oh, the South. You know, I'm from very north. I thought the South. Maybe there are people there who have had spontaneous revelatory experiences. I thought of the South as a kind of magical Faulkner-esque place where anything was possible and I could learn. We called the project Tongues on Fire, Visions and Ecstasy. And I went everywhere. I went to bookstores, I went to schools, I went to churches, um, I actually I even went to the DAR. It, it, that was really interesting. Um, all, all these things later. So I spoke to 
hundreds talking and asking for their stories of if they had had a vision. And it turned out that actually about 700, we collected about 700 visions. And this was one of them. These two women, Ruby and Violet, they told me, well, you know, bless you. Um, we were born with a veil. You know, I just, I went and made many trips. So I had just gotten off the plane from New York and I, you know, what to wear, how to dress, what to wear. I thought, you're born with a veil? How does a baby get born with a veil? I said, tell me, how does a baby get born with a veil? And they said, no, no, no. It's not clothing, it's not fashion. A baby is born, said to be born with a veil if a call is over the baby's face or the afterbirth is in the face more and you don't see the features. And those children that are born with a veil are said to grow up and to have second sight. And these two women did. They had second sight and they could foretell the future, they told me with about an 80% accuracy, and they would only tell themselves what they thought. So we did, we did Bill Mart's Small Visions Change Me, Change Who I Am, Change Who I Want to Be. Here's Angie and Belinda Tate, who's actually a curator in Chicago now, I think. So here we are doing the photo shoot for that billboard. Experience left me, and I felt weightless. And here is Reverend Mendez. My name was called In Darkness I See. And the final night of the almost two-year project, I had gotten really close to the spiritual choir. And the spiritual choir said, look, we're going to work with you and help you out. They took the visions that we had collected from the community. And they said, you know, we're going to take these and put these words to our traditional songs. And then for the first time ever, we are going to come out of the church, we're going to go to the museum, and we are going to sing to the community. And they did. And it was really, really, really special. Um, this was the first time that I had experienced language with music as an artist. So it was really the first time that I felt something could happen. And so thus, I was also very taken by Sister Gertrude and her music in a loud voice. Okay, so here's an image that I hardly ever show. I was so taken in by the Emmanuel Baptist Church that when the project was over, I felt called to join. And I told Reverend Mendez and Deacon Torbett, they said, well, have you ever been baptized? And I said, well, yeah, you know, I was raised Episcopalian in Maine. And they said, oh, that's not enough. We're going to do it the right way, and we're going to do it here. So, so here I am, and it is my church to this day. Okay, now here's just a refresh on the costumes. And again, you can see how these costumes lead right into Sister Gertrude Morgan. And here's the change for me. In doing opera, in doing something that's beyond an audience, I had to make the work bigger. I had to make the letters bigger. This is Andrew, my baritone. He would come up to me every day. He used to sing at the Met, and he would say, oh my god, I don't think I've ever sung the word sperm before. And I said, Andrew, get a grip. It's a whale. So, <laughs> no, it's Dickinson. So, here are the costumes, speaking larger. The Del Sol String Quartet, take all away from me, but leave me ecstasy. Take it all, this is so, so New Orleans. Take all away from me, but leave me ecstasy. Here we are. Okay, so this is sort of like a linguistic intermission because I was really, really tired and my assistants were really, really tired. And we had been working 14 hours a day for three years to write the music, for the costumes, for the animations. So what to do? So we were hanging out in our studio uh, living room, and here is, here's Aki, our border collie, and there's Claudia, big, great white Pyrenees. And you know, we had been working really hard making costumes, and I thought, wow, I bet Claudia would really like to have an Aki costume so she could look like her best friend, Aki. 
So after the opera, we made, so there is Aki looking at Claudia, and Claudia is in her Aki costume, and she is very happy. She is very happy. Now, Aki, in her, Cla in her Claudia costume, does not look quite as happy. <laughs> she looks more like a wounded soldier. So, there. So, and now, it's 2010, and Arthur Roger, as we have said, has, I'm so happy to have worked with him for over 20 years. He invites me to have an exhibition in his new all-white gallery. And this gallery now, and Bill, I don't know what you think, but this gallery to me just spoke to Sister Gertrude Morgan's all-white um, uh, mission church. And I thought, Here is her work, and I was ready now. I was ready through life, through acknowledgement of my own visionary world, and I fell in to this mystical, biblical linguist. I felt the impact of recognition for her and for her work in me, her visions, her pairing of text and image. And I wanted to do an homage to this strong, strong, urgent woman of deep faith. She was a lay preacher and artist and singer who lived in New Orleans from 1939 to 1980 when she died. And she dressed in ecclesiastical black while she was a street preacher and also worked in the orphanage. So I made a black dress for her. And I stitched on the red letters over and over, hell, 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 hell. And in white, the letters heaven, 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 heaven. I wanted to surround her with a kind of graphic novel of stories in black and white. She was born on the seventh day of April, on the seventh day of the week. She was the seventh child in the family. All of this is such, um, these are such biblical numbers. So she felt um, special for many reasons. And she was given, she was given to have a vision in which she was told to wear only white. So I was struck by reading in Bill's book about her having a vision, her being an artist, her working with music, her working with language. So she writes, he crowned me out in white to be the bride of Jesus. So, okay, so who else wore white only? What other woman only wore white in her adult life? Whoops, well, here's Sister Gertrude. Okay. So, okay, I will answer that question. Who else, <laughs> who else wore white um, for her entire adult life? It was Emily Dickinson. Emily Dickinson only wore white. She wore this kind of schmuck of white dress every day of her life. And, um, and who knows why? You know, in the cold, coldness of an Amherst winter, she would wear this delicate white dress. So here is um, a Sister Gertrude Morgan painting of an angel in the sea of words. And I thought, okay, I am going to make her such a wedding dress. So there it is. Her words are glory, power, glory, holy, great wonder from heaven, sing all along the road. The words on her banners and veils are revelation, everlasting gospel mission, bright crown, sing, I mean, I know all of you who work here, you've already had this all memorized, but you know, I'm only, here I am. Bright crown, sing a bright crown, calling, calling, I have a calling, power, power, power. And I mean, really, I mean, this is, the point is just, okay, and Dickinson, also, truth must dazzle, and to be alive is power. Oh. These drawings are of her mystical life and, and her visionary experiences. She heard, she 
she heard a voice like a trumpet, and, and I love that she wrote a confusion begin, a splitting begin. You know, when we move our mind into a world of non-understanding, sometimes we open ourselves up to unexpected, you know, good things that happen. So, um, and then I heard a voice like a trumpet. Here is, there is an all-seeing eye. Most of Sister Gertrude Morgan's quotes come from the Bible, and they come from the book of Revelations. And I needed help. How many of you out there have read the book of Revelations? Three? Four? <laughs> oh, the whole room. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. So I needed help. <laughs> so. So I got this book. So I'm going to tell you what the book of Revelation, or read to you what the book of Revelation is about. It is a prophetic vision of, and Jonathan, as Jonathan Edwards would say, of being swallowed up in God. That was Sister Gertrude's life. She was swallowed up in God. And in the book of Revelation, there are fantastic beasts and creatures that she has in her paintings that are symbols for individuals, nations, governments. There are visions from heaven, creatures with eyes covering their bodies, plagues, horses of different colors, angels everywhere, and seals are open. Seven, seven trumpets are sounded, seven bowls are poured out. The apocalypse reveals the end of the world in fear and glory. Or of Babylon refers to, for Sister Gertrude Morgan, and in the book of Revelations, it refers to the city of Babylon as the Antichrist. Rome was seen as the devil and the whore that was seduced away from the Bible. Now, I read somewhere, maybe Bill did, that um, Sister Gertrude Morgan moved to New Orleans in particular because of its reputation for for sin, liquor, and women. So she felt she had a lot of work to do. So in Revelations, it says, by the wine of her adulteries, the woman was drunk with the blood of saints. And then Sister Gertrude added to that, low down, dirty, cheating, tricking, wine, fornication. So, oh, I'm just sort of skipping all my images. Here we are. Sluts and harlots and whores. And here is the whore of Babylon. And I used an image of Durga, who is the fierce, strong Indian goddess of war. And here is hell with um, a, a Tibetan skeleton type skeleton on a running horse. Um, and hell is, of course, we think of hell as fire. But we also. Yeah. We also know that hell is water. Um, and from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river, and Neruda, and Malone like a tunnel, and Dickinson. You cannot fold a flood and put it in a drawer. You cannot put a fire out. And this church, I took a photograph of this church um, in the uh, mountains of, a colonial church in the mountains of Brazil. And the quote on the left side is from Kafka. Faith, like a guillotine, as heavy as light. And here, here we are at the, really, at the, at the end, and here at the top. His sister Gertrude saying, my heart shall not fear, the war should rise against me. And faith, faith encompasses a world in which unfathomable, unfathomable actions of violence and injustice and cruelty coexist with times of reflection and illumination. Faith contains as much fear as optimism and a kind of crazy grace. I am drawn to this. 
I am drawn to the big story. And to close, Sister Gertrude, my heart shall not fear, the war should rise against me. Thank you very much. Thank you.